Let's bow together for prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father, we thank you that the song we have been singing is not an expression of wishful thinking. But Father, as we read your word, we see again and again how you spoke to those whose desire was to hear you. You would speak to a child named Samuel in the temple and call him by name. You would speak to others, to men and women throughout history, speaking to them to tell them about yourself and about your will and about your purposes for us. And so we thank you this morning that as we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can expect you to speak by your spirit into our hearts so that as we live our lives the rest of this week, our lives can be the acts of obedience to what you've spoken to us. So thank you for your spirit's presence. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> In his book, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Heaven But Never Dreamed of Asking, Peter Kreeft, who is a Christian philosopher, has a chapter entitled, Is There Sex in Heaven? And he points out that the reason why that question might be a little bit disturbing to people or maybe intriguing is a result of our misunderstanding of what sex is. When we talk about sex or having sex, we tend to speak about something we do. Whereas when we come to the Bible, we realize that sex is something that we are. That each one of us has been given the gift of sexuality. It's part of our identity. It's part of who we are. And Kreef goes on to point, of course, that in heaven there will continue to be sex in the sense that we will continue to be human beings and sexuality is part of what we are as human beings. We are either male or female. That's part of our, our identity. It's part of who we are as human beings. And because in heaven we will continue to be human beings, then, of course, we will continue to have sexual identity. And God makes it very clear in the first two chapters of Genesis that human sexuality is part of his, a part of his purpose for us. It's part of his design. That the idea of maleness and femaleness are not the result of some social custom. They're not the result of some sort of biological accident but they are an expression of the will of God in establishing who we are as human beings. And we find in Genesis chapter 1 that it says, Then God said in verse 27, 26, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then in verse 27, So God made man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and so on. And so as we look at God's purpose for marriage, we see from Genesis that God is not only concerned that within the marriage we begin to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ that's why he has made us. That's why he uh, created us in the first place. That's why within the context of marriage, God uses the circumstances of our lives to conform our characters into the image of Jesus Christ. But here in Genesis, we see that God has made us as human beings, as male and female, for the purpose of doing his will. We are made to fulfill the will of Jesus Christ. We aren't simply made to be like Christ in character, but God puts a calling upon our lives, and that calling is to be fulfilled in and through our lives as men and women. And that when God brings us into a marriage, when God calls us to be husband and wife, he has a purpose for our marriage. He has a will for our marriage, not only that we individually and together should become like Jesus, but so that his will can be done through us. 
his kingdom be extended through us, that our life together, that our home, that the things that we do really become an expression of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That when we pray, thy will be done on earth, thy kingdom come, that a marriage relationship is to be a very real part of that answer. It's to be a testimony, an illustration, a living picture to the world of the kingdom of Jesus Christ being worked out in the lives of two people who are committed to him and committed to each other, and then through them out into the world. That's part of the will of God, part of the purpose of God for our marriage. And then Genesis, when God speaks about this, he tells us certain things about ourselves. He gives us basic insights into the unity and the diversity of mankind. And we're hearing a great deal of debate and discussion in our age about men and women and, and uh, the feminist movement and should we have uh, an equal rights amendment and all of these things that are raised up, questions that are being raised out of the whole context of maleness and femaleness. And we have opinions on, on either side. But here in the book of Genesis, God tells us two very basic things about us, about ourselves. One is he shows us our basic unity, that our unity is that as human beings, as mankind, we are made in the image of God, that whether we are black or white, whether we are male or female, whether we are rich or poor, whatever our racial identity, our social identity, whatever it might be, we are all made in the image of God. There is no human being who is less in the image of God than another human being in terms of their essential createdness. But God also shows us the basic diversity, and that's where a lot of question comes up today. The diversity of mankind is not racial. It is not social. It is basically sexual. That we have, as mankind, we exist as male and female. That's the basic uh, diversity that God has established. And that God has made us as men and women to fulfill his purpose. To do his will together. To serve him together. And we see in Genesis chapter 1, verses, verse 27 and 2, 21 through 23, the whole, the fact that what we are essentially. There's a danger in looking at maleness and femaleness in terms of social function. And so we start to say, well, there are certain things that men ought not to do if they're going to be real men. Real men don't eat quiche. I have a friend who put on the inside the, her car that real women don't pump gas. That's not a womanly sort of thing. And we've gotten some of these social distinctions that are not biblical distinctions, as though there are certain things men just don't do if you're going to be a real man, whatever a real man is. Or there are certain things that women don't do if you're going to be a real woman. Now, I think that whatever we do and however we dress and so on should certainly reflect our maleness or femaleness. We ought to dress in such a way that people know we're women. And there ought not to be any doubt about it. We ought to dress in such a way that people know we're men. We ought to recognize that maleness and femaleness are part of our identity, and we ought to be uh, pleased about that and not try to blur the distinction. But nevertheless, there are some social conventions that sometimes cause confusion by saying that only men can only do this and women can only do this, but those really ought not to define our identity because God shows us that there is, there are distinctions and there's a real distinction between in mankind and that distinction has to do with uh, maleness and femaleness. But he also points out that we are essentially made in the image of God, that we are created in God's image as male and female. We are equal in essence as one humanity. Now notice the wisdom of God when he teaches us this in Scripture. And if we would carefully study the Word of God as to what he says here, we would be saved from a whole lot of confusion and a whole lot of error. Notice that God, first of all, creates Adam as male out of the dust of the ground. Now, I think God is teaching us something there about the relationship between men and women in fulfilling the will of God later on. 
that Adam, as man, precedes woman. And I think that has something to say about man's responsibility to take headship in the relationship. We see that also later when Adam names the animals, establishing again his responsibility to give direction and oversight to creation. And later on, after woman is created, it is Adam who, who names Eve. Again, I believe God is establishing the relationship and the responsibility that man has in the relationship as far as headship and leadership are concerned. But in the wisdom of God in establishing our essential essence as equal in the eyes of God as being made in the image of God, he creates man first, but he does not, when he creates Eve, take another lump of clay or some dust from the ground and create woman. Rather, he takes the woman from the man. And he is telling us at least two things. One is that the woman is of, a, is of the same essence, essence in terms of her humanity. She is made of the same stuff as man is made of. Do you see how foolish it is to say that one is superior to the other? We're both made of the same stuff. So God is telling us that. And he's also telling us that there's only one stream of humanity. If God had made woman out of the dust of the ground too, she could have said, well, there may have been something different about the dust that God used. My dust was better than your dust. <laughs> God knows there's human beings. We like to find something that will make us different and therefore superior. God doesn't give that opportunity. He doesn't have, there are not two streams of humanity, only one stream. They both come from the same source. And then God does something else in his wisdom. From now on, from that moment on, no human being comes into existence except through the woman. So there are three clear, distinctive ways in which God establishes here that we are an essentially one humanity. That's clearly taught in the scriptures. Now, what we find going on in our society today is a great deal of discussion about men and women's roles, the place of men and women in the home and in society. And there are basically two popular philosophies of sexuality in terms of maleness and femaleness that you will find uh, going on in society. The one is chauvinism, and the other is egalitarianism. Now, interestingly enough, while chauvinism which is the idea that one sex is superior to another, has basically throughout history been the position that men have taken. We find more and more in our society that there is a feminist chauvinistic movement, which doesn't, isn't simply saying we're equal, but we're actually superior. Now, it would appear on the surface that these two philosophies are in opposition, but in point of fact, they are actually, they start from the same premise. Chauvinism says that all differences are differences in value. There are obviously differences between men and women. The sexes are intrinsically different by nature, not by social convention. There is an essential difference between a man and a woman. It's not just a social idea. Two things can be equal in value only if they're equal in nature. And so they say, we're not equal in nature, therefore we're not equal in value. One sex is therefore superior to another. On the other hand, Egalitarian, egalitarianism says all differences are differences in value. Notice that they've both concluded the same thing or they start out with the same presupposition. And this is why both of them are wrong. The sexes are not intrinsically different except by social convention. They would say there are no basic differences. That's simply a social convention and it ought to be changed. The sexes are not different in value, therefore they are not different in nature. Therefore, one sex is not superior to the other. And so both of them start with the same presupposition and both of them finish up in error. So what you're left with, with are two options, either sameness, everything's the same, or superiority. One is better than the other. What's the truth? The biblical truth is this, that the sexes are equal in value and they're innately different. A man is a man, and a woman is a woman, and vive la difference. God, 
God has made us certainly essentially the same in terms of our humanity. We're both made in the image of God, but we are not same in terms of maleness and femaleness. There are men and there are women. And there are great differences, not only biologically, but psychologically. And God has made us that way intentionally so that together we would reflect the image of God. He has made us to enjoy fellowship together, and in our fellowship together as men and women, we begin to know something of what God is like. If God had only made male, then something would be missing of the image of God in mankind. If God had only made female, then something important would be missing for, uh, from the, in the image of God in mankind. But it's together. As men and women, we reflect the image of God. And so both of these positions are mistaken. You see, as far as our humanity is concerned, we are equal. As far as our sexuality is concerned, there's a great diversity. And so God makes us men and women, shows us what we are essentially, and what we are to do vocationally. That our maleness and femaleness are not only part of the image of God, or not only the way, one of the ways in which God wants us to experience and reflect his image, but it also has to do with his purpose for us. He has made us in his image, and then he has given us dominion. We are to serve together in the will of God. We are called to serve each other and to serve God together. Some people think that God gave them a wife to serve them, or a husband to serve her. God has given us to each other to serve each other and to serve him together. God did not design marriage for self-satisfaction, but for self-giving service. Woman was created to be man's companion and co-worker in the joint task of ruling the earth. Some men think that their home is their castle. and that they have a throne room somewhere in the house. And they sit on the throne alone. And there's a woman in the, in the castle, and she's the palace maid. She's his wife. She's there to cook a meal, to clean the house, keep everything in order, while he rules in great splendor. Every once in a while, people should recognize his authority and make obeisance to him. That is a violation of the biblical concept. We are called to companionship as co-workers in the service of God. God did not create woman to serve man, but she created woman to serve God with man. We are called into marriage to be co-workers with God in our marriage and through our marriage and doing God's will and extending Jesus' kingdom throughout the world. Sacrifice in marriage, not satisfaction is guaranteed. We maybe ought to put that on the marriage certificate. Marriage guarantee, not satisfaction, but sacrifice. Self-giving sacrifice is guaranteed if you're going to have the kind of marriage God wants you to have. And so God has called us to serve him together. He's given us a vocation, a purpose, a will. And as husband and wife, we are called to fulfill that. That's why God establishes the principle of headship and submission. It's not to establish our identity. I'm the head of the house, period. I'm to be in submission, period. It is in the carrying out of the will of God. It is for the purpose of fulfilling the will of God that God establishes the principle of authority, of headship, and submission. And our ideas often of headship and submission are totally foreign to the scriptures. We've gotten them from the world. But Jesus said, the Gentiles do it this way, but it shall not be so among you. For he that would be the greatest among you must be what? What? Servant of all. He that would be the husband in a family must be what? The servant of the family. So that together we are learning how to serve God. That's why God 
one of the reasons why God has called us together in marriage and certainly, of course, why God has made us in the first place. We also see from Genesis that we are made to be complementary, to complement or to complete one another as men and women. I read an article the other day, and I want to read it to you. It's not a good thing homiletically to do to read things to people when you're preaching, but I'm going to read this to you because it, I believe, is an important article. It's by Paul Witz, associate professor of psychology at New York University. He says, in a recent book, Carol Gilligan of Harvard's Department of Education presents the case for the profound differences between men and women in their moral and psychological development. Gilligan's work, In a Different Voice, Psychological Theory and Women's Development, further undermines, undermines the radical feminist position that there really are no significant differences. There are those today who are saying there are no significant differences between men and women. And here is a book written by someone who's not a Christian that points out that that position is mistaken. And certainly it is not a biblical or Christian position. Gilligan characterizes sex differences in moral thought essentially as follows. Men make moral judgments on the basis of abstract principles and rules. Women focus on concrete situations and relationships. As a result, men treat moral dilemmas as problems to be solved by sorting out competing principles regardless of the personal consequences. Women instead see moral dilemmas as involving the horizontal network of interpersonal relationships, commitments, obligations, and duties. For the woman, the moral solution is whatever minimizes the suffering of, per of the particular people involved. She's people-oriented. The man tends to be more principle-oriented. This distinction between the sexes might define, be defined simply. Men want justice to prevail. Women want mercy to prevail. Have you ever noticed that in your discussions as men and women? And sometimes it can lead to problems if we don't understand that. These differences derive, Gilligan argues, from very different male and female psychology. Among other research, he refers to the studies which document a great difference in the play of boys and girls. Boys overwhelmingly play competitive games, games in which arguments over rules and fairness are common and intense, but seldom last over five to seven minutes. These arguments rarely actually stop the game. In the case of girls, their play is typically cooperative, and arguments are uncommon. But when arguments occur, the game is often ended. <laughs> I'm not making any judgment here. <laughs> Allow me to finish. Since the maintenance of interpersonal relationships is considered more important. It's more important to maintain the friendship than to sort out the difference in the rules. And that's why the game would tend to be ended at that point. Gilligan also examines how a woman's concept of the self is derived from their experiences. Male psycholog psychological development is from the start preoccupied with separation from others, with autonomous achievement, with ambition, with reputation. Female development follows a different pattern. Females see themselves uh, as coming into existence through the identity of the one related to, through fusion with the other, through nurturing and helping the other, through connecting rather than through breaking away and accomplishing individual, individualistically. A wife looks to her husband for that relationship, for that caring commitment, but the husband sometimes pushes away from that. He's trying to find something outside of that relationship, and problems develop. Gilligan's documentation is welcome support for the Christian understanding of male and female as distinct and distinctly valuable realities of nature and society. Her work and that of some others can be used to deepen our understanding of the psychological dimension of certain recently maligned or neglected scriptural passages. For example, take St. Paul's admonition to husbands and wives in Ephesians 5. To the men he commands, love your wives. By love, St. Paul makes clear he means loving service and servant leadership as shown by Christ himself. Paul is addressing here the greatest male weakness and the central female need. The greatest male weakness is the unwillingness to provide servant leadership. Men have a natural tendency to avoid commitment, to move on, to avoid interpersonal responsibilities. 
And when they do take on a commitment, it is often in terms of abstract principles. But what a woman needs is a husband's stable love. It is this love which maintains much of our identity. In short, the husband's committed, reliable love supports the woman's core, core moral and psychological nature. From such a feminine perspective, the ultimate male wrong is for the husband to stop loving, for him to separate himself from her in some physical or psychological way, or for him to be irresponsible in his commitment to her. Larry Christensen says in one of his books that the tap root of a marriage is a husband's love for his wife. And that whenever problems begin to develop in a marriage, one of the first things you need to look for is the husband loving his wife. If the husband is not living in a committed, caring relationship with his wife, problems will begin to develop. And the one responsible, according to Scripture, for the maintaining, for the initiating and maintaining of love in a marriage is the husband. And when you're dealing with marriage situations, zero in on the husband. The chances are he's neglecting his responsibility to love his wife. The importance of Christian love and service for the true moral and psychological development of man cannot be emphasized enough. Indeed, there is every reason to believe that male rejection of this principle of commitment is the primary source of our widespread family and social pathology. Do you hear that, husbands? Do you hear that, fathers? That our irresponsibility, our failure to love our wives is considered to be at the root of most of the family problems that are faced in our society. In many respects, the pathology of radical feminism is best understood as a reaction to the earlier rejection by men of interpersonal responsibility. To the women, Paul says, obey your husbands. He speaks here to the weakness particularly common in women to disregard the rules and to the natural male concern with rules, with order. In the marriage setting, disobedience undermines the husband's capacity to maintain commitment. To disregard his authority is to remove his function and destroy his ability to carry out his responsibilities. Whenever you as a wife begin to focus on a husband's shortcomings and to remind him of his failures, you begin to undermine his, authority, undermine his authority, and what you think will happen will not happen. You will not draw him into responsibility. You will drive him further away from it. The greatest mistake that a wife can make when her husband is failing to live up to his responsibilities is to constantly remind him of it. What he will seek to do then is to find a situation where he is affirmed. I'm not justifying this. I'm not saying he's right. But he will then begin to spend time doing the things that he does feel he's successful in. And so you will drive the two of you apart. Paul is also, or Paul Vitz is also pointing out that when Paul calls us to submission as wives, he is recognizing that there is a tendency in the woman to disregard the rules, to disregard the authority that God has established, and as a result, undermine that authority and undermine the marriage relationship. We are made to be complementary. We are not made for competition. That's what we're hearing today, competitiveness. We are not made to compete. We're made to complement. We're made to complete one another in serving God. This is why Satan keeps trying to drive a wedge between us, because he knows if he can drive a wedge between us and become competitive, then he keeps us from serving God. Oftentimes, we look to our marriage problems as somehow simply springing up within the marriage and only related to the marriage. We need to understand that Satan himself would love to destroy our families. He would love to destroy our marriages because in so doing, he destroys the image of God. He keeps the image of God from being seen in us. I believe also that's why we have this tremendous uh, philosophical homosexuality that's being perpetuated in our society. I'm not talking about people who are struggling with their feelings and emotions. I'm talking about this idea that maleness or femaleness is simply accidental. It has nothing to do with our essence. It is really, I believe, a satanic attempt to destroy the image of God and man, which has to do with our maleness and femaleness. 
And the Christians, we need to be aware of that. I need to understand something of what is happening. And it will not be dealt with simply on a political level, but it needs to be dealt with on a spiritual level, not only through prayer and intercession against the, the forces that would destroy the image of God in us, but it also will, needs to be taken care of in our families, in our relationships, where true maleness and femaleness are seen in loving marriages, in loving, concerned, committed Christians living together. That is the greatest defense against what is happening. It is not going to be through marches, and I'm not opposed to marches, nor editorials or books, and I'm not opposed to any one of those things, but what will save the family is a loving fa family. It's when people begin to see what God wants in the, wanted in the first place and what He can reproduce in us. That's why we're to be the salt of the earth. We're husbands committing themselves to love their wives in servant leadership. That's what we're called to. That's why Paul says the husband is to be a sacrificial lover. God has given to a husband the responsibility of headship or leadership in the home. This is not a right, but a responsibility to be exercised for the good of his wife and his family. Headship does not mean getting people to do things for you. That's what we tend to think. I'm now the boss. Now people will serve me. It is your being given the responsibility to God to do things for the good of someone else. It means that as a husband, we're to initiate and to maintain love in our family. The Bible nowhere tells a woman to love her husband, other than in the context of the great commandment, of course, to love God and your neighbor as yourself. But the Bible again and again says that a husband is to love his wife. Why? Because he is to be to her and to the rest of the world a testimony of what it means that Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And someday Christ is going to present the church to his father with great joy, without spot and blemish. And God has given to a husband the privilege and the responsibility of headship of allowing his wife to be conformed in the context of his love and commitment to the image of Jesus Christ so that someday, as Jesus will present the church to the father, he could present his bride, his wife, to the father and say, here she is, the one into whose hands you committed the care, into my hands. You committed her care. And through sacrificial, self-giving love has set this person free to be all that God wanted them to be. Some marriage relationships are like prisons. And the husband has locked the wife into something rather than seeing that God intended that it be an open relationship in which sunlight and fresh air and nurture could be there so that they both could grow to their full potential in Christ. A husband's responsibility is to guard his wife and family from harm, to be aware of what's happening, to be aware of what's coming into the home, constantly uh, grieved by what I hear of parents who are allowing their children to watch on television, ideas, concepts, philosophies totally contrary to Scripture, totally contrary to godliness and purity and good report and holiness. Ideas that are seen and presented that are destructive of their faith and children are allowed to sit and watch and enjoy. And it's a husband's responsibility to guard his home. We set screens around our home to keep bugs and other things out. We ought to set screens around our home to keep wrong ideas, wrong images, wrong influences out of our homes. The guard and the guide. Headship means guidance, directing in the will of God and in the ways of God. And a husband's authority is dependent on a right relationship to God. If you're not living in a right relationship to God, it becomes authoritarianism, bossiness, demanding. It flows out of a right relationship to God and out of devotion to wife and family. And when headship is related to both those things, then it's a real expression of the love of God. Otherwise, it becomes authoritarian, harsh, cruel, unkind. And the wife is to be a submissive helper. Authority and submission have nothing to do with value, but everything to do with vocation. 
authority and submission are the context in which we live out the will of God together. It doesn't have to do with value. It's not a superior ruling over an inferior. It's not an inferior submitted to a superior. It's of equal value in terms of their humanity as men and women committed to God, committed to one another, and serving God together. That's why God has established authority and submission. I remember hearing one time someone who said this rather in rather a proud way, the way he established his authority in his home, he took his one pair of his pants and he handed them to his wife and he said, put these on. He was quite a bit taller, bigger than she. Put them on. She looked at those and said, well, they don't, I can't wear those. Never forget it. There was a man who understood nothing of the biblical responsibility of headship. Do you know who's the head in the family? Not the one who wears the pants, but the one who wears the apron of service. Because in the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took an apron and he girded himself. And he washed the disciples' feet. And he said, I have set you an example. For he that would be the head, the greatest, must be the servant of all. It's not the throne that establishes headship. It's the apron. The servant's mark. Who wears the apron in your home? The wife is to be a submissive helper. She's not called to serve man as man, but to serve with man in the service of God. To serve together in the service of God, recognizing the gifts that God has given to each one of us, the abilities that come together in a marriage, and the joy of channeling both of those lives together, those minds, those hearts, those wills, those gifts, those potentialities together in serving God. That's the purpose of God for us in serving him. Ralph Martin of the Word of God community in Arn Arbor says, in my experience talking with married couples, I found remarkably few marriage problems that really involve marriage itself. Some problems, sexual problems, for example, are specifically related to marriage, but many, many more stem from a, cup, from a couple's failure to heed scripture's teaching about how Christians should act toward their brothers and sisters. Learning to live together as brothers and sisters in Christ is what marriage is all about, only it's in a distinctive con context. What is a marriage? How would you define a Christian marriage? I'm going to finish up with a definition of a Christian marriage. We've looked at the perspective of God for marriage. We've looked at the purpose of God for marriage. That we be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and that we fulfill the calling of Jesus upon our lives. A Christian marriage is a total commitment of two people to the person of Jesus Christ and to one another. It is a commitment in which there is no holding back of anything. A Christian marriage is similar to a solvent, a freeing up of the man and the woman to be themselves and become all that God intends for them to become. Marriage is the refining process that God will use to have us develop into the man or woman he wants us to be. Let's bow in prayer. We've said many things about marriage and many more things could be said. But I think it would be good this morning as we're closing that for those of us who are married, that we would ask the Lord Jesus by his spirit to make us the kind of husband or wife that he wants us to be. That he would do in our marriages what he wants done, that is, so work that our lives are transformed in the image of Jesus Christ and then that as husband and wife, we would commit ourselves together to the will of God. 
that we would say to Jesus, Jesus, we realize that you have brought us together in this relationship to do your will. We commit ourselves to it. We want our homes, our families, everything to be an expression of your will being done. Change us, renew us, refine us, release us. And for those of you who are not married, that you would realize that whatever, if God should call you into marriage, this is what he is after. He may bring you into marriage not because you need that other person desperately, but because you're finding your needs met in him. And ask God to make you the kind of person who can be to a man or woman what he wants you to be, who can truly love them, truly serve them, truly be used by God to bring their lives to maturity. Let's pray. Father, we commit all the things we've said about marriage these past weeks into your hands. We know that more could have been said and what's been said could have been said more clearly. But Father, we ask that what is of you, what has come from you, what is true to your will and your word, would become life in us. Dear Father, that we would begin to experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit as we commit ourselves to obedience, to go the way of the cross, to surrender to death, all of our own ambitions and our own independence, and to accept your sentence upon the independent life, and to be raised in newness of life with you in order that your spirit can truly work in refining, sanctifying, conforming to Jesus, and that our husbands will begin to say, God has given me a new wife. And wives will begin to say, Jesus is working in and through my husband. Children begin to notice the difference in parents. Neighbors begin to notice the difference in families and homes. That people will be attracted to Jesus Christ because of what they're seeing in us. And for those of us who are single, may we realize that our identity is not to be tied to another person, but to Jesus Christ. And it's who we are in him that matters. And whether we're married or not married, the secret of our happiness is in Jesus Christ. And that for some of us, you will call us to singleness in order to serve you better. And you will give us the grace and all that we need to live satisfied single lives. For others of us, you will call us into marriage. Father, would you do in us what needs to be done so that we can be to that other person what you want us to be. You can entrust another life into our care, into our hands knowing that your will will be done in us and through us. So thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the beauty of your plan. Thank you for forgiveness for past failures. Thank you for the promise of your spirit to enable us to know how to walk and giving us the strength and the wisdom in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.